Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Clemente, part of a family of physicians here at Medical Health Center in Monmouth County and your host of MHC TV. Coming up, a tour of the walk-in at Medical Health Center in Middletown to meet our first-rate healthcare experts right in your own community, where we can take a closer look at healthcare needs and treatment options. We also bring you some easy solutions to preventative care, something you can do anywhere, at any time, at any age, and with no equipment necessary. Plus, you'll also be coming over to my house, where we'll be cooking some of my favorite recipes to show you how simple, tasty, and satisfying healthy cooking can be. So join us as we keep our community connected to good health. During my many years of practice, I have seen lots of symptoms and thousands of patients. Sometimes they can become overwhelmed by their medical concerns. So whether it's about simple health concerns or more serious ones, patient education is vital and that's why we're bringing you this show. I'm Dr. Joseph Clemente and I founded the Medical Health Center to give our community easy access to a family-friendly, traditional approach to comprehensive multi-specialty care. Medical Health Center in Middletown, New Jersey is a state-of-the-art facility that can test, treat, and address multitude of health issues right on site. You can simply come in to our walk-in center. Whether you're just dealing with a bad cold, a flu, or something more significant like chest pains, or maybe you need an x-ray or stitches, our team of doctors is here to assist. Aside from this hub facility in Middletown, we also have sister centers located in Tinton Falls, Red Bank, and Hazlitt, and now that Medical Health Center is a division of Barnabas Health Group, we also are connected with Monmouth Medical Center, Newark Beth Israel, and other Barnabas Health Systems throughout our state, which expands your access to expert care even further. MHC TV is here to help explain and demystify the variety of health issues and treatments with leading doctors in their fields who practice right here and are available to you. So come on in and let's get started. Today we're here with Dr. Diria Dombrescu, our electrophysiologist. Um, she's going to be talking about devices such as pacemakers, defibrillators, and arrhythmias. Hello, Delia. How are you today? Um, why don't you tell us about atrial fibrillation and what the new management and treatments are for atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is a very common arrhythmia. It's present in millions and millions of people. It's felt like irregular heartbeat. It's felt like uh, uh, something rumbling in the heart, like beating drums, fluttering of a chest. So frequently we may have a patient that walks into our center and they feel their heart racing or they feel what they call palpitations. We put them on a monitor and we see that their heart rates at times are as high as 150. Absolutely. AFib can be slow and can be fast. Also can be totally asymptomatic. Now I see that um, um, not only you treat atrial fibrillation, you treat all arrhythmias and frequently some patients require pacemakers. Um, what would be an indication for a pacemaker and maybe you can show us what one of the wires looks like? Indications for the pacemaker nowadays include any bradyarrhythmias that is producing symptoms. That's Sym a, a slow heart rate? A slow heart rate where the heart rate would go below 30 while sleeping or below 40 while awake, producing symptoms like passing out, fatigue, shortness of breath, or even chest pain at some point. The device-based therapy at uh, this point is uh, called pacemaker. It has been on the market for a very, very long time. And what we do, it's a simple procedure in which we do two wires inside the heart and we attach them to a, a pacemaker. How long does one of those batteries last? Nowadays, it lasts a very long time, uh, seven to ten years, depending on uh, the procedural numbers. Maybe even longer than that. Now, sometimes they even go home the same day after a pacemaker has been inserted. Right. This is an implantable loop recorder. Actually monitor the electricity of the heart for uh, three years. Uh, that's great because we have many patients that come in 
we put a holter monitor on them and after 24 hours we find there's no arrhythmias but the patient over years complains of palpitations and dizziness one of these devices that can be left up to three years you definitely will catch an arrhythmia by then that's the key here actually we have to uh, actually detect what is uh, causing the symptoms without detection and proper diagnosis we can only uh, guess what is needed um, tell us a little about the defibrillators and, and the state of the defibrillators today. If you want a super pacemaker, detecting the rhythm abnormality that could happen in a patient like the one you describe and actually delivers um, high energy uh, to restore the normal electrical activity of the heart and essentially saving uh, someone's life. If somebody passes out outside and has sudden cardiac death, then is brought to the hospital, there are some steps that we all have to take. And once it's proven that there is an arrhythmic problem, then the next step is the fibrillator implantation, which is uh, going to save uh, the patient's life in the future. And, and believe me, many patients have been saved from um, sudden death with these devices. Well, Delia, this is very informative. Thank you for your time. And Delia is our electrophysiologist here in Middletown. Now that Dr. Dombresco showed us our pacemakers and defibrillators, in particular for our heart failure patients, now we're going to talk to Dr. Zucker, who works at Newark Beth Israel Hospital as the director of the heart failure and transplant program. And we will see the new advances in heart failure and transplant. We're here today with Dr. Mark Zucker, the Director of the Heart Failure Treatment and Transplant Program. Hello, Dr. Zucker. Good afternoon, Dr. Clemente. How long have you been the Director of the Transplant Program here? It's hard to believe, but we're now going on 23 years since I arrived in New Jersey from Chicago. Oh, heart transplantation is now the gold standard for patients with end-stage heart failure. Uh, expected survival after a transplant approaches about 13 years. Let's talk a little bit about the patient that needs a transplant. Obviously, we talk about end-stage heart failure and their survival one to two years, but what's the type of patient that you look for? Today, we would consider transplantation routinely in a patient who's in their early 70s as a, an acceptable option for that. Patients are individuals who generally can't walk from the bed to the bathroom without developing shortness of breath, but it's not just class four. I mean, we would consider transplantation in somebody whose cardiac function was very compromised, and we thought as doctors that their life expectancy was limited to no more than 12, 18 months. So when we, when we look at a, a transplant um, patient, um, you have to have a team, right? And you have, and, and there's very rigorous protocol before and after. You wanna talk a little bit about the team and what a patient needs to go through? Well, successful programs are highly integrated programs that tend to involve social workers, nurses, pharmacists, dietitians, cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, and I think you get the sense that it's a multidisciplinary team of all individuals working together to try to make sure that we've identified the right individual from a medical point of view and the right individual from a psychosocial point of view such that we're confident and comfortable that that patient will likely survive the operation, has the financial resources to survive the operation, and has the family support to survive the operation. And then post-transplant, um, there's another pretty rigorous program to follow. The early perioperative period is very rigorous, but once you get beyond about three to six months, the patients pretty much return to normal function. After one year, we see them no more often than every three to six months. And, and obviously, there's probably many more candidates than hearts to go around. The, the estimate is, is that there are, and I don't know for sure if this estimate is correct, but that there are 50,000 potential individuals who might actually benefit from a heart in any given year. We only have 2,200 or 2,300 donors. Um, patients that may need a heart transplant, but for instance have cancer or have kidney failure or have significant lung problems, they won't be candidates for the transplant. You've identified a population of patients that's becoming increasingly problematic for us, and so we use mechanical pumps. This is an example of one of the mechanical pumps that we use. It's one of two that's currently approved uh, for use as a, what we call a left ventricular assist device or an LVAD. And, and now, I mean, when you insert one of them, do they go in the body? Do they come out of the body? So this pump actually fits inside of the body. It enters uh, through an incision in the midline. We connect this to the apex or to the 
tip of the left ventricle. Uh, this returns the blood to the aorta, and this is not connected to a drive line, but there's a tube that comes out of the body to provide power to this pump, and there are two batteries that the individuals wear, sometimes under their shoulders, sometimes they drop them in their pockets, and those batteries power these pumps for upwards of 12 hours. And, and it's remarkable because we have some patients that, that come walking into the office and um, they have a nice smile on their face because they're walking into the office with them. We have patients uh, with these devices and other centers have had patients with these devices who go skiing, who do all normal activities of daily living. There are limitations though. It's important to understand that because you have a drive line coming out of the body, you can't go in the pool, you can't go in the ocean. It's a little bit more complex to shower. And, and what do they have to worry about? What are some of the complications that can occur being on a pump? You can have a bleed from your stomach. Uh, if the anticoagulation doesn't work, you can unfortunately wind up with a stroke. The drive line, because it exits the body, uh, puts you at risk for infection. So they're not necessarily entirely benign. And as, as I said before, we consider transplantation as the last resort when nothing else works. We would consider this probably as a step before transplantation, but certainly I would prefer to do more non-invasive or more conventional interventions. And if you have to have one, I imagine that's life-changing to the patients. It is categorically life-changing to the patients. What's new? What's, what's coming up? What can we expect? Uh, what I see coming down the pike, so to speak, is that uh, we might be doing stem cell therapy to try to fix the patient's problems. We might be doing gene therapy to correct the genetic defect uh, that causes the heart failure to begin in the first place. And uh, as we were talking earlier, you're starting, one, you're starting a stem cell protocol now. We are actively involved in a stem cell trial in which we take the patient's blood, we take the stem cells out, we replicate the stem cells outside of the body, and then we re-inject those stem cells into the heart using a three-dimensional mapping system to make sure that we've put them in the right spot. This trial is being performed for patients who have intractable chest pain or angina. There are other studies coming down the pike uh, to uh, evaluate and treat patients with stem cells for heart failure and for cardiomyopathy. Well, Mark, this has been very informative. Thank you for your time and good luck with your program. Thank you so much. Sometimes a common ailment requires a simple solution, or sometimes it can be an indicator of a greater issue. Either way, any concern should not be ignored. If a woman comes in with chest pain, the first thing we would do is get a comprehensive history, family history, see what medication she's taking, what kind of activities she does. Once we get the history, then we would do an EKG and we would have to do testing such as an echocardiogram and a nuclear stress test. In women in particular, it's important to do a nuclear stress test because very commonly their EKGs can be abnormal. So it really is more diagnostic to do a nuclear stress test as opposed to a regular exercise stress test. If more treatment is ever needed, we're able to refer you to a variety of experts and subspecialists within our Barnabas Healthcare system. When your family joins our family of doctors, you gain immediate access to quality care, no matter what your age or ailments. Whether your needs are pediatric, elder care, women's care, or issues ranging from cardiovascular disease to weight management, or even simply clarifying medications and doses. We all know how important diet and exercise are to good health. So here's a fun and very accessible solution to get you and your loved ones moving. When it comes to kids, it's great to get them involved and away from that computer at an early age. Dance not only builds fitness, but also discipline, self-confidence, and real, not virtual friendships. These are all great developmental tools that they can carry with them for life. Hi, I'm Miss Sheila, and welcome to Middletown Dance Academy. <laughs> Physically, dance is amazing because it creates stretch, strength, as well as technique in your body. It teaches them how to memorize, how to comprehend on a quick basis, and how to be competitive at the same time. The body ends up looking long and lean with a lot of muscle tone behind it. 
Dance is important to one's life, not only because it's a great form of exercise, but it just gives the dancers the courage and the strength to actually get in front of an audience and perform no matter what they're doing, whether they're speaking in public, whether they're dancing in public. To have dance in their life and to have exercise and health in their life is very important to them. It carries through their entire life. Um, I take dance because I have my team behind me and they're my friends and they surround me and it keeps my body in shape which is very important and I drink a lot of water when I'm dancing and it helps me stay healthy. Um, I chose this because it's something that I love to do and I've been doing it my whole life and it just gives me a sense of like leadership and team and everything. It just brings it all together. I definitely think I'm going to pursue it in college and I don't know where I'm going to take it after that, but I definitely will keep it a part of my life. Dance is accessible because there are dance studios all over. And if you're not at a dance studio, they provide it at the gym or at churches, um, different facilities like that. I mean, it teaches me how to manage my time well, I think. Uh, I would never give up dance because it's just like a part of me now. Like I've been doing it for forever and it makes me feel good and I just, I love it. I hit some bad moves when I'm out at parties. It's crazy. <laughs> it's good. You know, do anywhere. That's what I love about it. I can never give it up. Try it because you don't know if you're going to find that love in it like anybody else does. And you get like a feeling when you dance and you can let all your emotions out and just be yourself. Yeah. Guide dancers are great. <laughs> no. no um, yeah, actually a lot of like male dancers that we see are like physically fit men, yeah. And with their strength they bring a lot to the dance room. Why not? You could be around like 50 women. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> it gives you balance actually, like football players take ballet for balance, so. And it leads to making healthy choices. How inspiring was that? At our age, we don't have to do it at that pace. But dance is still something accessible to anyone, at any age, in any weather, no excuses. So go ahead, even if it's just learning some new moves in the privacy of your own home, stand up and start moving. Not only do we want this to be an educational show, because most of our patients, if they're educated, they can treat themselves better. I also try to do some cooking and teach you how to cook and eat healthy. However, I do have a food taster, and I'm going to introduce you to this food taster. His name is Gus. One of my favorite things in life is enjoying good food. But I also know that food plays a serious part in our health, especially heart health. Right now, the all-you-can-eat and supersize me mentality is rampant in our society. It's even to the point where many people feel gypped if they don't eat all they can or get a supersized soda that they paid for. One of the simplest and most important things you can do is to remember that before you even open your mouth to order, think about portion control. So let's go in the kitchen and I'll show you more about what I mean. Hi. We're now going to make a tilapia dish. But first, let me wash my hands. It's always important to keep your hands washed in between meals, and even when you're preparing even different parts of the meal. So these are two fillets of tilapia. I just put some lemon on them before we started, because the trick to this is lots of lemon and lemon zest. So whenever I have tilapia, I like to use um, different spices. This is a garlic parsley spice with a little salt and we'll just run that over it. Paprika is always something I like to use with fish and we'll use some paprika on this. We'll have some parsley flakes and a little salt and pepper. And this is going to be a baked dish and I'll add lemon zest to the lemon. We're trying to make this as light as we could. Pour some of this over the dish so that I can coat both sides. Now once it's coated, I want to put some breadcrumbs or some flour before I start the baking process. And what I've learned is 
just a little bit of flour, a little bit of breadcrumbs, but I like the crunch. I've learned to use cornflakes, and basically I take a hand of cornflakes and I crunch them up. And all I do is add it to my flour, add it to my breadcrumbs, and mix it up. And these breadcrumbs were seasoned breadcrumbs, Italian breadcrumbs. I just take my fish and I coat both sides with my flour, breadcrumbs, crushed cornflakes, and then we're ready for the oven. I put a little water in a pan. This way it will create some steam as it's cooking. I'll put my aluminum foil on. I usually will spray just so it doesn't stick. And then I place my fish on there and I leave some of the lemon zest, um, lemon mixture, which will add for the last two or three minutes of cooking. This will go in at about 370 in your oven for about 20 minutes to 25 minutes. So it's in the oven, basically 20, 25 minutes in the oven, 370. And the last 10 minutes, I'm gonna add some more lemon over it. Now while that's cooking, we're going to make a side dish. And the side dish I decided will be some green and red pepper, which we're gonna saute, and then brown rice. I like brown rice because it also has a texture to it. Remember, you know, your tongue has sensation. You, in different parts of your tongue, feel salt and, and sour and sweet. And also, your palate and, and tongue feel texture. So you want to have some texture, and I think brown rice gives more texture than soft white rice. So I'll just slice a few pieces of green and red pepper, make them to smaller quarters, put some garlic, parsley, and salt mixture that I've created um, over the green and red peppers. And I always use olive oil. I rarely cook with anything but olive oil. And in Italy, they only use extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> and we just want to cook these down just for about a minute or so before we add the rice. But when you add the rice, you need a little liquid. And rather than use water, I like to add some chicken stock. So I'll just pour a little bit of chicken stock in there and let that mix around. So I bought this brown rice and all I do is throw it into the bowl, start breaking it down a little. Let's incorporate some of that chicken stock. We want chicken stock. And that should be good enough. And what happens is we're going to let this slowly cook, turn down the flame, and in about two or three minutes, it'll be ready. Okay, as you can see, it's crusting well. And now I'm just going to add that lemon I told you over both pieces. And we have about another 10 minutes there. As you can see, um, if you prepare your ingredients ahead of time, this meal should take no more than a half hour to 35 minutes. Basically the time it takes the fish to cook. Because while you're doing that, you're sauteing your um, rice and peppers, and they'll be ready at the same time the fish is, and um, you're ready to go. And this meal should be no more than 600 calories. So once we're done, here's the tilapia with the lemon sauce. And here you have your brown rice with the green and red peppers. Place a little lemon on it if you want some more. This is a very easy dish. Everybody seems to like it. Even, even people that don't like to eat fish. Now, Gus, on the other hand, loves to eat everything. So Gus, do you want, you want a taste? Are we gonna give you a taste? Let's see. Come over here. Come over, would you like to sit down? Sit down, do you want to taste it? What do you think? Good? All right. I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about preventative care and self-reliance. In other words, taking control of your own health care. Sure, we live in a time when medical innovation can offer you pills, stents, and surgery. And what's it gonna be? Stents and surgery or diet and exercise? Thank you for joining us. We hope we've educated you about cardiac issues. We also hope 
that you've been inspired to get up and get moving. And most importantly, to take greater preventative control of your life. Remember, choices take only a moment to make, but can last a lifetime. So make sure yours are healthy ones for you and your loved ones. We will always be accessible, whether it's in Hazlitt, Middletown, Red Bank, Tinton Falls, or any of our other offices. Whether you come to our walk-ins, whether you have a question, whether you need to have some specialists, please contact us. We're there for you. We'd like to welcome Dr. Ricca to our new Hazlitt office. In our next episode, we're going to be focusing on pediatric issues. In terms of pediatric obesity, actually some of the highest rates are in the age two to five category. Even um, in the state of New Jersey, it's 17% of children aged two to five um, are obese and about you know, um, 10 to 15% in the adoles adolescent age group. To, to get them to follow has to be from the whole family, you know, in terms of, you know, the exercise and the nutrition, you know, all the brothers and sisters and both parents need to be on board, right. not just to say this one child in the family is overweight or obese and they're going to follow this plan, but everyone else is going to do something different because then they feel alienated um, and, it, and, and they don't follow through. Half your plate should be filled with vegetables, okay, non-starchy vegetables. A quarter of it would be your protein or the size of your palm. And the other quarter, an average fist size, would be the carbohydrate. You're looking at 776 calories, which is actually 64 teaspoons of sugar in one of that you're pouring people. into your body, yes. As well as we'll focus on a local high school football team. Also, our track coach, you know, told us soda is bad for you. And ever since I stopped drinking soda, you know, I've seen a lot of benefits in my skin and in my performance on the track and football field. And lastly, I'm going to cook a zucchini dish with zucchini in a red sauce, pecorino romano cheese over pasta. Portion control, you can eat well, you can make great dishes, and we'll see if Gus likes that. I'm Dr. Joe Scamenti, keeping the community connected to good health. See you next time. Since this is an educational show, if you have any questions or would like to see particular topics, please contact us and maybe we'll use your suggestions. Write to us or use our email address and let us know.